say this was the other way around, say this is me doing it, whatever ca camera I'm looking at, I'll say, right, ordinarily I'll do a big introduction to tell you all about the guest, but this is not impossible for me because he's my mate and has been for a long time <laughs> and I'll start laughing, so I'm not even going to try. Here's my pal John Cross from the Lead Football Writers, one of the best in the business and a top class bloke. This is going to be fun. Hello, I'm John Cross, Chief Football Writer of the Daily Mirror, and with me this week is a very special guest, a big mate of mine, an absolute broadcasting legend, and a legend, actually, of a bloke as well, Jeff Shreves, um, launching um, Football Music and Me, his podcast, which we will talk about. Um, but I must say, I I'm feeling a little bit nervous, Jeff, because I'm, A, I'm talking to a mate, and then B, I'm talking to someone, well, who is an absolute master of the art. Of oh, the say, interview. Uh, Crossy, I've got to say, that was a very polished intro. So <laughs> clearly you're not that nervous. Well, no, I wonder where I got the idea from, but <laughs> there you go. No, I, honestly, we will come on to the podcast shortly because you've had some brilliant guests. And uh, listen, actually, we, we, we shared a long phone call on the way up to, to Manchester City on, on Sunday for, for the Arsenal game, didn't we? But also um, loved listening to the podcast on the way up. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But I also want to kind of get your views after the weekend, if I may. Let's start with that. So after the weekend that we've had, another amazing weekend, we've got games absolutely coming out of our ears at the moment as well. Who is going to win the title? Who are going to be crowned champions in May? Well, I mean, you and I were sat alongside each other. We spoke all the way there. <laughs> we sat alongside each other at the Etihad. We're at the game of the weekend. I mean, some fantastic uh, games in the Premier League, some real... Fantastic late, late shows. I'm thinking Sheffield United, uh, thinking West Ham, Newcastle, and we were at the biggest ball fest known to man. <laughs> now, I'm not criticising the tactics, because people will tell you it was tactically fascinating, but it was hard work, wasn't it, mate? Yeah. I know, look, we're lucky. We get paid to watch football. You shouldn't say a game is hard work to watch. But dear, oh dear. Yeah. That was... Uh... Was it a missed opportunity for Arsenal? No. Uh, I had this discussion on CBS last night. Um, one of the hosts said, oh, they'll regret it. They should have gone for it more. Mm -hmm. I said, well, hang on a second. Think about this. The last two occasions they've been there, they've shipped four and five, respectively. Yeah. So they know if they go there and they try and play expansive football, they are likely to get beat. Because man for man, they previously, they have been inferior. OK, so they go there with a, a more positive attitude and a, a greater belief. So then it comes down to the game plan itself. Now, Arsenal's game plan was to restrict Manchester City, seed possession, and at the same time, hit them on the break. Yeah. I think there's a decent argument that Arsenal had the better chances. And funnily enough, the best chance was where Trossard should have squared it to Martinelli. Yes. Uh, yeah. In about the 80th minute, something, 80th? 80th minute, something like that. So... Was their plan not to win? Of course it wasn't. It was definitely not to get beat, but yeah. I wouldn't be overly critical of them at all. No, mm. don't, you know, don't forget, Liverpool shut them out as well. So I, I, I think it's wrong to... You've also got to assess as well. Arsenal go there and get beat. What, does, what damage does that do, not just to the points total, but also psychologically? For the running, still nine games to go. Yeah, yeah. It's nearly a quarter of the season. Yeah, yeah. So, do you would is it would it have been foolish of Arteta to say, "Come on, let's make a statement, gung ho, let's go for it from the first minute"? They get beat, and then I think mentally that would have been really hard to recover from. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think they went there with a lack of ambition. They just had a plan to win that nearly came off, that wasn't overly expansive. Yeah, you and I were sat in the in the press auditorium after after the game, weren't we? And it's always interesting, I think, listening to the managers and then sort of almost reflecting on what they said afterwards. There was one long answer which we both remarked on afterwards, didn't we? Sort of from, from Pep Guardiola. You know, I think it was to Oliver Kay's question, wasn't it? And basically, it went. You know, I think I think the general premise was that basically, you know, a city worse than last year. Basically, yeah. that was the general point. Well, Oli Kay said to him, "Are City not as good as they were?" Mm. Basically, and Pep immediately bridled at that and said, "No, no, no, no. You know, we are as good. We are as good." But then I thought Pep actually, you know, listen. Occasionally he can be a little bit short. 
and not give you much. I thought he was really good because he expanded. He said, look, I'm telling you now, I know my players. I know how we played. He said, you've got to recognise how difficult it was to beat Arsenal today. Yeah. He talks about killing one of them or getting them to play with nine. And then he said, it's not that our level has dropped. Arsenal and Liverpool's level has come up. Mm. He said, that is what has happened here. Mm. Which I thought was, you know... I thought it was honest. And I also thought it was... I, I don't know what you thought, but I didn't think he meant just that game. No. I thought he meant just Absolutely. generally across the course 100%. of the season, 100%. you know. And I thought that was fascinating, really, because... I, I must be honest, my take on it is that basically City aren't quite as good as last year. They're not quite as fluid. Well, but I do think that they are, st- in my humble opinion, they are still better than the rest. I think that if, if, if you do a deep dive into the stats, the XG, which I, I, I can never quite make up my mind. I, I, I must admit, I, I am a, a charlatan and a shallow individual. <laughs> that only use stats when they suit me <laughs> to support my argument. The XG against City has increased. Mm. So they are giving up more chances. Mm. So that tells you they are slightly more vulnerable. Having said that, though, if you look at the league table, out of the leading three, Arsenal have lost the most games. They've lost four games. Mm. The other two have lost three and two, respectively. So, look, you know, you can throw a hanky over the three of them right now. And it's... I think because it was built up, it was built up to be such a seismic game. Again, don't forget as well, in that mini table, Arsenal are the only one that have had a victory. Yeah. They've beaten Liverpool and they've beaten City. Yeah. So if you said to Arteta, start the season, this is where you'll be, April the 1st, this many games, you'll have taken four points off of Liverpool and four points off of Manchester City. He'd have said, where do I sign? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Are Liverpool favourites now? Yeah, they are, because they're first in the table. Yeah. Um, OK, I'll, I'll throw it back at you. Is it theirs to lose? I think so, yeah. It's too far out. But what, what, it's interesting that, because I think a lot of people are sort of saying you have to be perfect. But you can either think of it in nine games left, or you can think of it in, you know, after this midweek, we'll have eight, and then basically after the weekend, seven. And at which point... I still think, I think you, you, you've made me think about it in a different way because nine games is a quarter of the season left. Yeah, and then basically right. following, you know, after last weekend, I don't know that anyone does, you know, it's very rare that you can win well, look, 9, 10, 11, 12 on the bounce. Liverpool, Manchester going to Old Trafford. 0-0 at home. Yeah. Got done there in the FA Cup. That is not a walkover by any stretch of the imagination. In the same way that Manchester United and their fans would love to spike Liverpool's title challenge, so will Tottenham. Yeah. With Arsenal having to go there as well. So a lot of football to be played. So you're nailing your colours to the Liverpool mast? Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I've got to have a winner from you. I think all those factors you're, you're making. Yeah, at the moment, I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think Liverpool will win it. Mm because of those factors. Mm. I think Arsenal have got some tough, tough games, you know. And that's not to say, oh, you know, Arsenal aren't as good as Liverpool. It's nonsense. Yeah. You know, it depends on what Saka's injury is like. It, yeah. It, it, you know, there's, how soon will Martinelli be back? He was only fit for 30 minutes the other day. Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Jesus didn't look quite right, did he? No. So... I think that's a depth issue for Arsenal. I do, I do think that basically those guys, if you look at them, you know, he's just probably not because he's, he's you know, had a few injuries along the way. But the other two guys have played so much football. And at various points, I think the luxury is that basically being able to put yeah. someone else in and take someone else out. John, I would have the caveat, you having corralled me into a corner saying, you want me to nail my yeah, colours for the that's last... That's so the master say, who would, yeah, say, who would... I would say Liverpool. Ask me again next Monday, and I might say Arsenal. Yeah. It's only as we speak. Yeah. It's as we speak. Let's move it on to England. Sure. And basically, how do you feel that England will do um, this summer and at, at, at the Euros? And I'm going to get you to pick your own England 11 in a moment, but how do you think That's they'll easy. do? That's easy. Um, I think, look, I'm as confident as I was going into the World Cup um, when we lost to France. The, the one, as we know, the one that got away was the Euros, yeah. especially the manner of it, the final. I think 
we've evolved. Uh, I, I'm a big Gareth fan. Yeah. I know that uh, he has his critics who say, tactically, in the heat of the game, he's too slow to react. Yeah. I think that final, he would probably have done things differently. Yeah. But overall, I think what he's done in the shape of the squad and what he has, if you like, I do like the expression, he's made the shirt that little bit lighter to wear, which might sound a bit of a cliche, but I do. The, you know yourself, England, there were players that didn't want to join up, yeah. getting booed, mm. getting, getting, you know, it just, it wasn't a good experience being part of England for the players. Mm. That's changed completely. You can see it, the, the feeling around the camp, around the players. I think the camaraderie, the unity that he's built counts for an enormous amount. Yeah. I think they've got momentum from the last from the last two tournaments. Yep. So I think that they'll go there with. I think they'll go with good. Exp- Listen, we're among the favourites for good reason. Yeah. Based on results, but again, you know, there's some big, big teams here: yeah, yeah. Spain, France, Germany. Look like they might be resurgent. Coming back. Yeah. yeah. And I know we played them the other night, but Belgium have got something about them as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't stray. Who who do I? I think England can win it. I'd, I think they'll go a long way in the tournament, and then it's the toss of a coin, mm. isn't it? You, you need a bit of lady luck. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think I think we're a good side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, I mean, one of the other great things that you do, giving you lots of praise here, Legends of Football. And Gareth, you know, for people that don't know, it's a great charity event, you know, supporting Nordoff Robbins, isn't it? And And I think Gareth has been... You know, you've got to know Gareth because he's a great supporter, recipient, yeah. and then basically, you know, he's 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 really backed you to the hill. Tell, tell us a bit about Gareth, the man, and from your experience away from the football manager. Yeah. Gareth um, is just a, a top class individual for me. Absolutely, he really is a class act. So, legends of football. We for nearly twenty five years now, we've been raising money for music therapy. Um, Nordoff and Robbins is the charity we support. So we have a, a dinner basically every year at the Grosvenor House. And this is where the new podcast comes from because we combine football and music. So we have a recipient. We start out with the great man himself, Il Gigante, John Charles, was their very first recipient, who he said, I'd love to. He said, but I, I don't actually have a suit. He said, so, you know, we got him a suit, brought him up. He was a lovely, lovely man. And then we've just honoured so many of the great and the good. Brian Clough, Sir Alex Ferguson, Arsene Wenger, Frank Lampard, Jose Mourinho, Cantona, Pelé. The list, the Alan Shearer, Stephen Gerrard. The list is endless. And then, of course, we've evolved. So Ian Wright and Emma Hayes last year. And the year before that was Ellen White and Gareth Southgate. So I already knew Gareth anyway, from having worked with him. Uh, and I, I, people make the mistake of thinking, oh, he, he's a nice guy. He's got a steely resolve about him as well. And he's more than happy to put his point across, or if he disagrees with you. And he's single-minded too. So, but I also went to see him and I said, look, we're going to raise this money. Um, and we agreed that we would help uh, a charity that's very close to his heart, we would give some of our proceeds, called Martin House, which is the most wonderful and the most desperate place at the same time. It's basically um, a children's hospice, and Gareth goes there to support, and he often pops along there, and he sees parents or children who, who, who are going through, well, we're both parents, we can't imagine, it makes, makes hairs on the back of my neck, it makes me tingle now, I think, but it just, it's horrific, horrific, and he supports them steadfastly. He's fantastic with them. So then we start talking about his taste in music uh, and, and what he likes, and pretty straightforward. But he just threw himself into the project. You know, he said, "Yep, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll do that." I said, "Look, I need a prize from you." He said, "Well, I'll tell you what we do. I'll take ten people out to dinner uh, at BT Tower. The chef there." And a, a, a guy I know called Frame bought it. He messaged me the next day. He said, we had the most fascinating, he's a, a guy in the city. He said, it was fascinating. Gareth gave us a real insight. You can ask him any question you like. 
about leadership, about any other sport, because he's so well read. Just amazing. Yeah. Just absolutely amazing. So I'm a, I'm a big Gareth fan. And I can see why they're talking about him with Manchester United. Yeah. And I do think with the new structure of ownership with Sir Dave Brailsford, with Sir Jim Ratcliffe, I could see how that could work. Doesn't mean it'll be successful. Mm. I think he would be a good fit for them. Mm. I yeah. really do. Yeah. No, can't. Now on the night, on that night, I don't know if you were there that night. Um, I think I was with Gareth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I, we asked, we ask our legends to do a speech, and you can still see this on YouTube. Yeah. Gareth said, "What do you want me to talk about?" And there's two things I remember about that night. First and foremost, we'd had on the stage. Um, we'd had a couple of people who spoke about Gareth who's his teammate who spoke about oh my days it's escaped me now but we'd had several people we'd had a comedian we'd had James Bay play on the night as well because we have bands we've had Stereophonics we've had Roger Daltrey um, we've had Rudimental we've had all sorts of people so we'd had all this stuff so Gareth stands up he said right and he listed all the entertainment we had so far he says, 10 past 11, you've put on the driest bloke in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderfully self-deprecating. Yeah. He said, look, I've been asked to give a speech. He said, it's very straightforward. I'd asked him, what does it mean to be the manager of England? And he gave a 15-minute speech, which was Churchillian. And it wasn't trite. It wasn't just ticking the normal boxes. He was fantastic. Yeah. And I had so many people say to me afterwards, I'm going to watch that again tomorrow. I had people come up to me and say, I run a business. I'm going to show that to more, all my employees tomorrow. Wow. Fantastic. It was all about, yeah. it was about pride. It was about community. It was about being elite and about doing the very best you can and getting the best out of yourself and the people around you. Yeah, I would. I would encourage anybody to go and look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was no, sensational. He, he is inspiring. I tell you, I tell you, one, another one of those nights after seeing Rudimental, which was so loud and so brilliant, it just inspired me to go and buy, you know, buy a couple of CDs. You know, amazing, absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. They nearly got a shut down that night because yeah, the noise was so loud. It was incredibly loud. Wasn't yeah, it? no, we had the hotel loud, complaining. But, you know, fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Right, now, I'm going to get you England 11 before we move on to music. Pickford, Walker, Stones, Maguire, Shaw, hope he's fit. Yep. Rice, <laughs> Bellingham, <laughs> Bellingham, <laughs> Kane, Foden, Saka, Manu. I, I think there's a discussion to be had over him or Trent Alexander-Arnold. I think the one thing that counts against Trent Alexander-Arnold, who... Um, you know, as a midfielder, I think he's, he's arguably England's most creative player, best passer. But the big thing that goes against him, I think now, that he wasn't able to play, I think he's played in six games, not necessarily started, yep. in midfield for England. Yep. Now, that's either started as a, you know, as a full-back, moved into midfield, or, or started as midfield and stayed there. I just don't know whether... You know, having missed those two games in March, and those two games in March were definitely seen as an opportunity to sort of kind of give him his midfield berth. I don't know whether it's enough. I he's just not, don't. He's not, had, he's not had audition time, has no. he? No, and that's a big thing for me. So I'd probably go. So then, also if you're Manu as well, if you're if you're Gareth now, so what we've we got two games left. How many games? Well, two games left before the Euros yeah. against Iceland, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Right. But, so but if you're gonna, the squad is named before those games. That's the key. If you're, yeah, you're going to play... Yeah, but I think he'll take both of those players yeah, anyway. Yeah, But I, I think he'll play his starting 11 in both. If, if, if you're going to play Manu, you've got to start him in both of those games. You've got yeah. to bed him in. Yeah. So I think Gareth's got to make up his mind now on that position. Yeah, yeah. There's one other that I'm going to pick you up on, Harry Maguire. Because yeah. I know, you, you, you know, you, you get on well with Harry, don't you? You know, as an interview and sort of kind of good bloke. I think we all respect Harry. Yeah, but that, that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't, that wouldn't you know, colour my do, view. No, 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 no. But I, I, in a way, I, I feel it does with me because it, it, it sort of says to me what a good character he is. Oh, he's absolutely... Because he basically rides through everything and I think that makes him a good leader. And I think that is, you know, lesser characters, lesser individuals would have been... 
broken by some of the criticism and, and, and everything that's been thrown at him. And I think to come through it all, I, think, I don't think he's let, hardly ever let England down. I think his partnership with Stones, you know, is, is arguably the best. Mark Guy, I think, comes into the conversation, but he's obviously been out injured. You I, know. I, think, I think with Maguire, with, with Harry, he's not only never let England down, there's a strong argument when uh, Ten Hag was trying to get him out of the club, mm. he's come back in. He's, he's one of the players, along with McTominay, who's kept Ten Hag in the job. Yeah. So, you know, he's a, he's, he's a stoic individual. And f from what I know of him, he never gets too high. He never gets too low. And even when people put it to him, oh, you've shown great mental fortitude, he's kind of like, well, to be honest with you, you know, I want to play more. I, I want to play. Mm. I know my chance will come. And I back myself when it comes to playing. So... Yeah, get on. Kind of, yeah, kind of doesn't yeah. see what all the fuss. No, he doesn't, does he? It's I'll quite, you, quite I'll refreshing. Tell you a funny story about Harry. I was at um, I was at Kenneth Shepherd's wedding last summer, and uh, the, he, Kenneth, who runs, you know, Kenneth runs Soccer Aid, and uh, I've arranged to play golf with Harry the day before. And he's playing with his brother and his dad. <laughs> I said, right, see you there. See you at the golf course. I get a message early morning. Can't they can't get an Uber or a taxi? Can you pick them up on the way? I've got a tiny little Ford Fiesta, okay? <laughs> Not, so there's Harry, his dad, his brother, and his sister's boyfriend, right? I'm telling you now, Harry is the smallest of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like Noddy in Toy Town with the feet up around the neck. I'm not, he, he's got the character, as I say, he is stoic. Yeah, I'd 100% be yeah. picking him. Yeah, and no, not, that, that's not, my point, really. I, I love that. I love that personality. You need personalities. Massively. You need leaders. Not not just because I like him as, a, as an no, individual. No, sure. I also think his, his partnership with John Stones. Yeah. As well, uh, and you can't ignore, hopefully, the Luke Shaw aspect. Mm -hmm. His partnership with him as well. You know, they're they're my unit. I just feel right now when they put on their England shirts, that eleven, feel like they belong feel like they are, not arrogantly, feel like they are the unit. Yep. And away you go. Right, let's talk about the, your move into, into music, and particularly the podcast, really. Now, the two, the two things, football, music and me, I mean, they're basically marrying football and music together, isn't it? And, you know, I don't know whether... You know, you'd agree, but basically, music is such an important part, equal to football, most to you, isn't it? Music is huge oh, in your life, isn't it? Massively. I've I've always been uh, a music. I've always liked music. I wouldn't claim to know lots about music, and I've already interviewed several people where I've got no idea what they're talking about. Come on, let's be <laughs> honest. But that almost doesn't matter because I'm interested yeah. in the music that they like, why they like that music, how it speaks to them. And then it broadens. Because of the work I've done with Nordoff and Robbins as well, how, pe how music affects people's mood, how it can lift people, how it's used as a therapy, people with dementia, people suffering all sorts of other conditions, particularly children with autism as well. It's a breakthrough. It's a way of communicating. So on my way here today on the train, um, I'll put some tunes on. There's no question. It's like, you know, when you come out of the gym. Obviously, mm. I don't come out of the gym enough <laughs> before you say it. <laughs> More like when I come out of the gym. <laughs> I played some tracks and it absolutely elevated my music. Yeah. I'm also interested in, for footballers and for sportsmen, what music they listen to. You know, some will listen to music to get themselves up for a game. Jamie Redknapp was, was really interesting. Mm. He'd often listen to music, take himself down. Because he, he, I was amazed that he used to get, when he was younger, really, really nervous before games. You know, yeah. He was physically sick. Yeah. So he would listen to music to bring himself, to calm himself down on his Walkman, as it was in those days. Yeah, yeah. So I find all of those aspects interesting as yeah. well. And it's a, it's a really simple idea. I'll talk to footballers about music, and I'll talk to musicians about football. Yeah. Because virtually every musician, well, certainly that I've spoken to, they wish they were footballers. And most footballers <laughs> would quite like to have been musicians as well. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, going back years and years, there's a long tradition of a synergy 
between football and music. And that's what I'm looking to explore. Yeah, you've even got me playing the piano. <laughs> we, we talked a lot about this at the time, but basically, you know, I, I had, you know, you know, share this, that basically sort of inher I inherited a piano and then basically tried to take it up and get it tuned and it was too old and decrepit. So I bought myself a new one, although it was made by Chelsea. So I'd play, sit there playing on a piano with, with Chelsea and blazing <laughs> <laughs> Um But, you know, it, it, you, you do play the piano and you love music and, you know... It's... I, like, I like playing the piano. I don't practice enough. I wish I was better. Uh, I'm certainly not particularly good. Uh, I, I personally, I like boogie woogie. I like that more than anything else. I mm. like a bit of sort of, I like a little bit of rhythm and blues as well. But that's, that. I aspire to be able to play like Jules Holland, which well, is never going to happen in a no, million years. No. Well, I always remember saying to you when I took up lessons, basically, you know, how long will it take before... I can play the piano. And you said, oh, no, not long, not long, not long at all. You can't three get... years. <laughs> and I said, three years? <laughs> I haven't got that much patience. <laughs> you can get a basic tune out of it. Mm. You, can, you can play a recognisable tune. You know, you can play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star with one finger. Mm. Yeah. So you can get a tune and you get a reward from that as yeah. well. And if you think as well, when we're not working, we spend all our lives, you know, online looking at screens. It's just a really pleasant break for yeah. half an hour of the evening to be able to sit and just play the piano. Yeah, I'd love to play. I mean, Sir Alex Ferguson took it up. He he enjoyed it for a while. Yeah. Um, Tony Adams did, didn't he? Tony Adams, uh, Anthony Robinson at Fulham is an excellent player. Right. Um, Nathan Ake oh, right. took okay. up in. Um, I think he took up in COVID as well. Right. So there's a whole host of footballers who like their music. Some go to a lot of gigs, some are really into it. Oh, sorry, I didn't mention, by the way, uh, not a shameless plug, but Legends of Football this year, uh, remiss of me, um, our legends this year are Wayne Rooney and Farrah Williams. Mm. October the 7th, uh, lofootball.co.uk, tickets are available now. Um, and Wayne absolutely loves his music, mm. loves his music. Mm. He's yeah. a real music fan. I remember doing an interview with Wayne Rooney when he was just broken in, and so I felt very lucky and privileged to do that. And basically, he showed. I basically, we did do a few quickfire questions at the end of the interview. He was mm. quite shy in those days, and basically, not shy, but basically a little bit, you know, mm. just nervous. He was sort of a, still a teenager, and must have been well, seventeen. Probably aware of your reputation. Well, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> um, um, and I think he chose as one of his favourite songs the. the, the, the I think, was it The Glass Blowers, but Daughter? You know, ever such a slow yeah. ballad. He's got, he's, got a really, he's got a really, really eclectic amazing. taste. I'm yeah. due to sit down with him at some point, ahead of Legends of Football. Right. So I'm really looking forward to finding out. Yeah. I know he's a big Stereophonics fan. Yes. Uh, and I know he's an Ed Sheeran fan as well. Right, OK. Oh, so. Interesting, yeah. You know, on your first episode with Gary Neville, you know, you talk about the sort of kind of the... I love that synergy about, about Sit Down, James, that, that song. You know, that he basically talks about how when he left school at 16, he basically, you know, at the Leavers, you know, the, the few of his classmates sat down on the floor and basically did the same thing at the, at the new Camp after 99. You know, and both when times he, James sit down. Was unbelievable. Black. There it was, you know, and, you know, that's, that was remarkable. It's a nice, great insight into, into Gary. Look, Gary, Gary likes, that's the other thing as well, the idea of the podcast yeah. is that it, it expands the conversation. Yes. So you can talk about... It's not just what music do you like, what are your favourite tracks, or your favourite yeah. bands. It expands onto the meaning of music in their life, music at certain points in their life. Is there, Are there tunes that remind you of certain parts of your life, either successful mm. or otherwise? So that's... The other thing as well, we, we've chosen deliberate... We don't play music in it. It's not like Desert no. Island Disc. Mm. Because people say, well, I, I know most of the tunes anyway. And we put a playlist on the back of each episode as well. They don't want to interrupt it, the conversation, which I found, you know, I, I was unsure at first. Yeah. But the feedback we've had, people said, no, I'd rather not have the actual music in there. No, it's a great, it's a great listen. Absolutely. The Gary Neville one I absolutely loved. And you've got Vinnie Jones in the second one. You told me a great story <laughs> about how you... Come on, you, how you even Which, help Vinnie, launch Vinnie Jones' his acting career? Well, that, Tell that, us about that. that, that that's not true. There's a little bit of a spin on that. but Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 yeah so Gary was the first one. Yeah. Um, that's up there now on wherever you get your podcast from, Apple or Spotify. 
Or if you've got a smart speaker, you can just say, Alexa, play football music and me. Uh, and in fact, Gary Neville as well, he's put us on his channel, The Overlap, so you can watch it on The Overlap too. So if you do, if you haven't heard Gary's one, you know, Vinny comes out this Thursday. Uh, we wanted, I wanted somebody from Wimbledon because they are widely credited as being the first team to introduce music into the dressing room. So it was important to us to have somebody from that era. Mm. I've known Vinny, I played football against him when I was 16. Mm. And so we go back a long way. And also I know he likes his music too. You know, he's had, he's had a really interesting life, Vin, a really interesting life. So, uh, I mean, he's Hollywood star now, isn't he? I don't know if you've seen The Gentleman. Uh, it, I'm watching it, it. yeah, he, it's he, really good. Vinny was funny because uh, he was over. He said, right, I'm here for two days, come and see me in Claridge's, or that's it. And I said, okay, fine. I sat down, the very first thing he said, I said, this is good of you. He said, this is the only second, this is only the second podcast I've ever done. I hate podcasts. I said, why? He said, and because now he's an actor. He said, because I'm not promoting my film, he said, there's only one person getting paid here and it ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> With a big smile on his face. <laughs> now, it's funny, because I just reminded him, looking back, to, you know, Vinny's 130, 140 movies, whatever the number is now. Wimbledon were playing Arsenal at Highbury. And his dad, Pete, lives in Coney Heath, near to me, in St Albans. And um, I went to the interview with Vinny there did the interview, etc. As it goes, he scored a really good volley that weekend in the game. We finished doing the interview and I said to him, Vin, do us a favour. I said, I've just started helping out this new charity. It's called Legends of Football. Could you do a sort of a message to camera where you say something along the lines of, right, listen, this is for a good cause. Get your hands in your pockets. Otherwise, I'll be coming up there. Give it some of that. So a bit stereotypical hard man script, I sort of said to him. And he said... Uh, Okay. Cross, he's done it. He's done it straight down the barrel. <laughs> and he's delivered this performance. I went, wow, Vin, that's pretty good, that. <laughs> and he said, well, it's funny you should say that. He said, I've just made a film. I, f I said, a film? <laughs> and nobody knew anything about it. He said, yeah. He said, a mate of mine. He said, asked me to be in it. He said, I've got a part in it. He said, the film was called Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. He said, mate, you never know where it might lead. <laughs> And look at him now. Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant, isn't he? He's, I, I, I love him in The Gentleman. He's really, he's well, almost in an understated way. The Gentleman, Vinny, plays himself. Yeah. Because Vinny is a natural countryman. I think he was head of Hertfordshire Countryside Alliance at one stage. <laughs> he's always been interested in gamekeeping, in, in rearing animals. Oh, he's a proper countryman. He's got yeah. his farm now in Sussex, hasn't he? Now, I want to talk to you about the art of interviewing. And basically, you, you know, you've interviewed so many people, so many people down the years, and post-match, pre-match interviews, set pieces, everything. Is there one, I don't know, is there one rule or is there one kind of philosophy that you've always stuck by? Is there a secret to it? Uh, it look, you, you can do an interview, same person, a thousand different ways, mm. I always say. My number one, my number one rule always relates to what is the most important thing about a question? Mm. What's the most important thing about a question? What would you say? Tell us the story. That's wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> I always go, my, my maxim is the most important thing about a question is the answer. Yeah. Simple as that. So it, it could, you know, obviously I've done sit downs with celebs, film stars, music people, footballers who are injured, footballers who have just scored a winning goal in a cup final or whatever. Mm -hmm. But first and foremost, as they're walking towards you or when you're preparing, you have to assess your, not just your relationship with them, and there might be no relationship whatsoever, but you have to assess as well the type of person they are and what they respond to. Mm. So, say for instance, let's, let's take managers under pressure. I might have to say to a manager, that's now, or so, say Sean Dyche at the moment, mm. you know, Sean, that's 12 games 
But I mean, Sean, actually, Sean's a bad example because he's a good interviewee. He's, he's very straight, good, gives good answers. But certain managers, you might have to say, OK, that's 12 games now without a win. Um, it's the run you're on. How difficult do you think it will be for you to turn this around? And given that, do you think you'll be given time to do so? Mm. So you've really got to... Somebody else, you could say, something like Steve Bruce, you can say, well, what about it after that? Mm. And he'll answer. So you, you, so for, first, for me, first rule is most important thing. It's not about us. It's not about you and me. It's no, about sure. what they say. Mm. We're secondary. We're just prompters. Now, of course, some people need a bit more prompting than others. So it's about asking the question that will elicit the best possible answer. Sometimes it will need a fault. Now, some people, you need to signpost where you want to go. Others, because they're naturally good talkers, will just go there. Mm. anyway and then it's a process of elimination mm. the bottom line is we're not there for us it's about what your readers or in my case mainly what questions do the viewers want answered mm. that's what you've got to think about yeah yeah I always think that, you know from a newspaper point of view sometimes it's about the quotes that you elicit from the piece you know so basically it's slightly different in a way because it's you know people will say oh, well you know I think it's slightly different in the way that you would answer it to kind of, you know, get them to explain themselves. You can open it, you know. Oh, they did, look, they're different, you know, they're different, different, media, different, they're different mediums. mediums. We, are, we, we are more truncated. We've got two, mm. three minutes. Quite often mm. it's live. It's a more pressurised situation. And you're physically at arm's length. Yeah. You're quite often in a press room. There'll be 20, 30 writers in there. And you can come at it from different angles. And when then you come away you can formulate whatever the story is. But I think the principle is the same. We yeah. talked about a press conference yesterday. It's about getting the best possible answer. So in the same way, when I'm doing an interview, I think straight away, okay, that's an ir a really, there's the line. Yeah. So when I was doing these podcasts, I haven't changed my role as a journalist. When each of the people said something, I'm thinking, there's your line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's your line. And, and the other thing I would hasten to add as well, I think there's a misconception about journalists, whether they be broadcast or written press. You're not looking to trip people up. You know, I, I always liken it to being a bowler in cricket, in that certain people you'll fly it up a bit, others you'll chuck one down hard, others need a bit of a spin. It's not, you're not trying to catch them out, it's trying to get the best possible result. Yeah, I totally agree with you. S simple as that. Yeah. I, lo I, lo I love interviewing. I always have, it's my favourite part of the job. Yeah, yeah. Favourite part. Yeah. Of I love studying the techniques and the one thing I always try and do at the start of a sort of a press conference, if, if there's no one else winning or whatever, just an open question. What did you make of the game? Because sometimes, you know, if you, like, I remember, if, you know, a few weeks back, sort of David Moore had just been stuffed 6-0 at home or whatever it was by Arsenal. And basically it was, you know, just trying to, draw some words out of a manager who's got so much respect what within the say? game. Well, it's just basically, you know, what, 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 you know, what did you make of it? What were the reasons behind it? You know, basically, just a very open-ended question to, just to get him talking because, you know... Did you call him Moisey like that other fellow? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, like, I like the guy that did that. Who it was, was that? a moment of madness. Well, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a young journo who's, who's a smashing journo. And basically, it was just don't know quite what came over him. <laughs> And it just wasn't there. I, 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 like you, I get on really well with David. And basically, sometimes... Oh, ask, David took it into good humour. Yeah, asking, you know, the, these guys who you know and have a relationship with after a difficult game can be, can be, can be, can be a tricky I think, one. An really. Another aspect I would point out as well, which uh, I was lucky where I came through at Sky. I was surrounded by a lot of good, experienced journalists, mm. former written and then gone into broadcast, is having respect for the person you're interviewing. Yeah. You know, he's doing his best. So in that scenario, David Moyes didn't set out to lose 6-0. No. He's put out his best team, his best tactics. He's in a difficult position. Yeah. So you've got to have some empathy for them as well. You've mm -hmm. got to have some sympathy. You've got to have some understanding how difficult for them it is. But at the end of the day, you know, 
question needs to be asked. Oh, it's the and then I, I'm going to take you up on, on, on that, really, because the question needed to be asked of Arsene Wenger. I knew you know. And basically, we spoke about this, and the basic may or may not have spoken about it for a certain book. But, um, but basically, you know, 8 2 at Old Trafford. You and I both respect this guy so much, don't we? Oh, and like basically, him as a, like you, him as a you know. But it was a, you know, it was such a shocking result, yeah. such a shock defeat. Never expected that in a million years. Even refunded though refunded the fans' money. Wow, there First you go. First time ever in the club's history. Wow, I did. Yeah, I'd forgotten that. Wow. So, so post match, in my post match interview, I asked him basically whether or not, and he was going through a tough time yeah. as well. Results have been really poor. He was under massive pressure. As part of the interview, I asked him whether or not. He, he thought he should carry on, yeah. which he said, absolutely. And then I said, do you think you know, you'll know you have the backing of the board to carry mm -hmm. on? And he said, absolutely. But I could tell he was furious. I could tell he was irritated. So he's then down the tunnel doing various other interviews, and I can see him looking across at me. And I spoke to Mark Canella, who was the head of comms at the time. I said, do you think I should have a word with us and just to you know, square it off? That They were perfectly reasonable questions. He said... I don't, he said, I don't think you should do that. He said, I think right now he wants to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> and, when, and when I eventually spoke to him, mm. he said to me, you know, how can you ask me those questions when mm. I've just lost eight to at Old Trafford? Mm. I said, well, I asked you those questions because you've just lost eight to at Old Trafford. Yeah. So, but look, it's... It took a while, didn't it, to sort of, you know... I mean, I think you're very... You, you get always got on very well yeah. with you, but it took a while for things to no. thaw a little bit, didn't it? No, uh, there, was a, there was a certain Freudian, I think you would say. <laughs> it was a, it was a I've been there, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but that, that can happen. Yeah, of course. course. It's, it's, it's hardest when you've got a, a close relationship yeah. with the person. That's when it's hardest. Yeah. Um, when you have to divorce. You know, and, they, and quite often you can have a a good friend on the backroom staff or something like that, mm. you've still got to do your job. Yeah. But the top, top people, do you know, people talk about Joe say how he could be, you know, I've heard him described as toxic or, you know, go after people. Never ever found, you know, he's not somebody I text every day saying, how are your mates or anything like that. Yeah. But we had a really good relationship. Yeah. He never ever once Objected to the line of questioning. Wow! Never took it personally at all. Wow! That's 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 you know. Now, you know you could say things. I, I say nothing. I cannot speak today. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I, he got himself into a few, a few, few bits of trouble, didn't he? When he was uh, when he was our legend of football, um, he came over on the Real Madrid plane. Him and his agent George Mendes basically bought everything in the auction. He was brilliant. He fabulous. was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous. Now, another infamous one was the new Camp. Tell us. Uh, which part of it? <laughs> yeah, people forget the JT part of it. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a two-part tragedy. <laughs> yeah, Ivanovic. Ivanovic. Yeah. Now, you know, it's just reminders because he's... Based, I mean, you, you, you knew that he was, he was banned, but he, no. he obviously... No, no, no that's the whole point. <laughs> So, semi-final, they've already had JT sent off. Um, and then, at the end of the... In the, in the game, yellow card was issued, OK? And we weren't quite sure, our commentary team wasn't sure, who had been booked. We thought, we thought it might have been Ivanovic. In fact, I'd say to underline as to why people were saying, do you know what he was booked for? No. There you go. I was, I was there and I don't remember, you know, right. I just don't, you know. Do you remember they conceded the penalty? Drogba gave away a penalty. Yeah, yeah. He scuffed up the penalty spot. Wow. So it was ungentlemanly conduct. Right. So in amongst the penalty, there's a... Work, though. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we're not sure. We tried to clarify with UEFA because we knew it meant he was banned from the final. Mm. At, at, the, uh, at the new Camp, it's a really old concrete building, so you, you're hardwired. I haven't got a mobile pack. So I'm in the elbow of the tunnel. I can't physically move. I've got my back to the players coming up and they're going to chuck a couple of players in front of me to do the interview. So and they're going to throw down live. Yeah, the place is bouncing. It's great mm. atmosphere. In comes Czech. Brilliant sort of. Fantastic. Mm. In comes Ashley Cole. Bubbly. Ash is good. I'm about to start. In slides. Somebody puts in Ivanovic. And I literally thought... 
Well, I can't swear on here, but I thought, oh. Because <laughs> I've got to ask him now. Yeah, yeah. Because if I ignore him, I can't say to him, yeah, he, how much are you looking forward to the final? Because he'd, he, he'd say, we're talking about you, fool. I was just booked. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm banned. And I can't say to him, you're banned, you're not playing the final, because we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then I, I sort of do a couple to Ash and to Pat, and I think, I'm going to have to go there. There's the elephant in the room, I'm going to have to do this. So I go to him, I say, and I try and get clarification whether he's booked or not. I said, you know, were you booked there? Because if you were, that means obviously you can't play in the final. And he, he did this kind of, yeah, um, and he doesn't really answer. No. And it doesn't seem to have registered. So not only have I had to go there, I've got to go there again. <laughs> so then I said, you, you do realise if you were booked, you can't play in the final. Because it, and it, again, it's a similar, there's no real reaction. And, oh, it, it, it's just horrible. Anyway, get out of it. And there's, there's no, there's a party. And normally, you know what it's like, particularly if you've upset somebody in the team, the rest of the squad are not happy. So if I'd done something bad, JT would have come out or a Frank, a senior player would come out and say, hey, you're out of order there. What you did with Branner, nothing, everything was fine. I start walking back to the hotel, my phone starts lighting up like a Christmas tree. I think, oh God, <laughs> maybe this hasn't gone as well as I hoped. <laughs> and then, uh, I think it was Lee Westwood who brought it home when he tweeted, Jeff Shreves has just told me I've never won a major. <laughs> oh, God. So anyway, it goes badly. Anyway, a week or so later, in the build-up to the final, I interviewed him, even though he wasn't playing on the pitch when they won. He was fine. And I messaged him, I said, look, I'm really sorry about the way it came out. He said, look, no problem, no problem at all. And it was only... I think two years ago, our friend Ali Rudd in the Times, yeah. she did an interview with him when he's at West Brom. She said, I must ask you about one of the most infamous things in your career. Oh, sorry, in between time, they won the UEFA Cup, I think. Yeah. He scored the winner, the header. I messaged him. I said, thank God, you'll be remembered as a Chelsea hero and that goal rather than that poxy interview. <laughs> he, he messaged straight back, laughing, all the rest of it. Yeah. And Ali said, can I ask you the truth about that interview? You know, what... And he said, yeah, he said, um, honestly, he said, the, the coaching staff made the decision not to remind any of us who were on yellow cards that we were on a yellow card. So I didn't actually know I was on a yellow card. Wow. He said, and then I wasn't sure during the game whether or not I was booked. He said, I certainly didn't know when Jeff interviewed me. Yeah. He said, so I was then, I was in the dressing room, I was partying and great. It's only exactly when I got on the coach and I looked at my phone, I realised I wasn't playing in the final. <laughs> so it was a perfect storm that turned into a perfect shit storm. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was, the, the, the ludicrous nonsense that I did it deliberately to provoke a reaction, anybody who knows me, knows my work, no, no. no chance. No. Could I have phrased it better? 100%. I could have said, look, Brian, I'm really sorry. I don't know whether you were booked or not. If you were... That means you can't play in the final, which is tragic because you were brilliant tonight. Yeah. And he might not have, yes, could have been handled better. Was it entirely my fault? No, but I'm the person with the microphone, so I take responsibility. Yeah. But what, what was your favourite interview? I get asked that a lot. Um, it, it's non impossible. It, I just love the interviews, the, the immediacy of it. I mean, I like the, the, the breaking news ones, whether there's a line. Uh, but you know the likes when Liverpool won in Istanbul mm. get the, uh, the interviews straight away it's funny because we were doing that with ITV and Gary Newbon was their interviewer and there was a tradition amongst us and whoever the host broadcaster was or the other English broadcaster often was ITV you flip a coin to see who gets first interview wow. so Gary wasn't around so our producer did it with their producer we win Come back, Gary Newborn storms into our truck. This, no, this is no, we, we, we've got this again. He said, No, we've already done it and we've won. No, he said, No, I'm ITV's official tosser. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a backstop to it. Right. But, but then on, on that night to get uh, Jersey Dudek, you know, Cara, Gerard, Xavi, Alonso, when they've just won in that fashion, those are the nights. 
Manchester United with the, the winning goals, the Chelsea boys, the invincible seasons, well, just magical. Because often as well, you've been on the journey with them, not as in your part of the team, of course not, but you've been doing the interviews and the build-ups yeah. to those games. So you know, you know, what it what it means as well. Yeah. But equally as well, you know, you've got to do the tough ones. You've got to do the teams that have just been relegated, the, the manager that's just been sacked. Mm. All of that stuff. Yeah, no, it's very, very difficult. I listen, I've been lucky. I've been really, really lucky. It's a, it's a great job. One more yeah. treasure. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to f- finish on a question straight from your podcast. Music or football? If you could only have one. And that's the, that's the question that you pose to your guests, isn't it? So music or football for you? Yeah, I think it is uh, the most ridiculous, antagonistic question I've ever <laughs> posed in my life. I've got no idea where it came from. I don't know what the point of it is. <laughs> I'm thinking of quietly dropping it from the podcast because <laughs> it's a stupid question. Um, it's, it's not a case of either or. We love both. Uh, I, no, uh, I would say not only can I not answer that, I would like to know the fool who came up with it. <laughs> Love it. You can't Love choose, it. mate. You can't well, choose. Yeah, you're supposed to. <laughs> they, they do on your podcast. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Uh, I think that one, that might have to get quietly squeezed pulled. out. Yeah, yeah, but like I said, it's just, it, it's fun, it's enjoyable listening to people and their love of music. You know, we've had some great guests on. Um, I mean, in the can, we've got, it's yeah, just, just, just tell us who have got, yeah, mu- got music-wise in particular coming up. Uh, Serge from Kasabian. Yeah. He'll have had a good day yesterday. I tell you, I really liked was Beverly Knight as well. She's such a sweetheart. Right. And she said, you know, she's a massive soul star in this country. And she just loves the anonymity of going to Wolves. Yeah. Really. Being part of something much bigger. Yeah, yeah. I that. asked her, what well, I thought it was a reasonable question. So her idol was Prince. Yeah. Prince obviously became aware of this. He invited her to sing at his private party after a concert. And I said to her, what was the best gig you ever played? Was it Prince's private party? Or was it when you were invited by Dave Jones to play at the private party for the Wolves team at just one promotion? She went, oh, that's not fair. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. No, I love it. Really Brilliant. like that. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, we we'll have a lot more of them. Yeah, of course. Brilliant. Jeff, Jeff Powell, thanks so much. So enjoyable. Top man. Thank you. There's a good 30 seconds yeah. in there somewhere.